Hi, this week's video is all about revision, since that's the main thing that you are doing this week, revising your personal essay. And before we start talking about that, I want to go back to the purpose of this assignment, which is to develop strategies for learning a genre that you're not familiar with, because you will encounter that in your personal life and in your professional life in the future when you leave the university or you go on to grad school. Genre or a style of writing, every genre has specific patterns. And when you follow those patterns, when you can figure them out and follow them, you make yourself seem like you are part of the community that you are writing in. And a lot of times when you're asked to take on a genre, you're not given instructions on doing that. You have to figure it out. And that's why this assignment is so uncomfortable. I'm not giving you all the answers. I'm giving you some directions to seek out the answers and asking you to follow a mentor text. And so as you are writing, you're studying that mentor text, figuring out that structure, and you're learning the conventions or the patterns of that style of writing, which is the personal essay. So I asked you this week to read um, some articles, um, Bascom, Lopate, Esfahani, and Graham, um, four articles that talked about the personal essay. And I wanna review a few things. Um, Bascom talks about the organization of a mentor text, and he compares a mentor text, or I'm sorry, he compares a personal essay to an academic essay. He says personal essayists, reflective essayists, like you are right now, tend to circle around a subject, wheeling and diving like a hawk. Um, instead of an, an academic essay, you create a thesis and you aim straight for it. And he says, this seems more organic, this personal essayist style, because that's the way we think. We don't come up with the main answer, the key answer. First, we have to think about it. And we think about our experiences, we think about our observations, we weigh them with facts and data we've acquired over the years or recently, and then we can come to a conclusion. And this illuminates things from multiple angles. So at the end, we discover an answer or a tentative answer. Graham describes the same process a little differently. He says an essay is something you write to try and figure it something else. Figure out what? You don't know yet. And so you can't begin with a thesis because you don't have one and you may never have one. An essay doesn't begin with a statement, but with a question. In a real essay, you don't take a position and defend it. You notice a door that's ajar and you open it and walk in to see what's inside. And so many of the essays that you've read walk in and when, they're when you're done reading, you notice that the answer is still sort of tentative. It leaves you thinking. And that's the purpose of this essay. So the rest of our discussion, I want to talk about how I'm grading. But before I start that, um, this is, I can't remember if it's Anne Lamott or um, Annie Dillard. Um, it's one of them. So there she is. Your personal essay, um, I want to caution you, your personal essay is your story, but it's not about you. Your story is an illustration that shows your readers how you figured out this deeper meaning or this deeper truth that challenges your audience to think about this deeper thing, giving them new perspective about the world or about their own lives. So if at the end you have come up with a truth that's only about you, 
you have written a personal narrative. If you come up with a deeper truth that enlightens or challenges an audience, then you've written a personal essay. So on to the rubric. Now, 20% of your final grade is based on how you follow your mentor text. So that means you've got to study the structure of your mentor text and you're following the structure of that mentor text. And you're looking at rhetorical strategies your mentor text chooses and you're considering how you can incorporate those. Um, what kinds of things does your mentor text describe? What tone does your mentor text adopt? Um, you've got a chart that you're working from and as you revise, you want to update your chart as you recognize new things that your mentor text is using. You're submitting, resubmitting that chart as part of your final reflection. And there are places where you might choose not to follow the structure in some part. For example, in the, of the three student texts um, that I showed you, um, um, bottoms up, did not end with a call to action um, the way Kelly Linfors did. And the author was writing to people who were in recovery or in the process of recovery. And um, the author did not include that because um, ending the way he did, lifting his own glass, that was a call to action. It was a very subtle one and he chose that very deliberately and that's what i'm asking you to do if you veer off from the mentor text in some way have a reason for that a reason that you can justify that shows that you are being mindful or reflective about your writing that you're making rhetorical choices um, considering your audience and your purpose that's 20 percent 10% is the way your final product looks. Did you choose a magazine that is appropriate for the personal essay and your topic? And does it look like it would look if it were in this magazine as a online magazine article? So um, does your, the magazine you're writing for does it include pictures? Then your finished one should include pictures. Um, it almost certainly includes your name, a title, a title font. It might have a subtitle. It might have the date on it. Um, pay attention to all those things. Your title matters. Um, so I'm grading you on your title, 5%. Um, it should be engaging. It should hint at what's to come without saying your thesis straight out. Um, look at some of these. Laugh Kookaburra. It hints at what's to come. Australia and seeing a kookaburra and the memory of an incident between David Sedaris and his sister where they're singing the Laugh Kookaburra song and um, their dad comes in and um, um, yells at them multiple times, but they keep singing. And so here's that hint of what you're gonna read about without saying, hey, this is an essay about family and success and the value of family. Um, documents, hints at the fact that Charles D'Ambrosio is going to review a series of documents that he discovers and then the meaning of those documents. Um, once more to the lake is about a lake, but it's not really about the lake. It's what he discovers by returning to the lake. Um, all of these titles are saying something important without saying the main part, but they're intriguing. Um, you will be graded 20% on cohesion. 
How do you organize this? Which stories do you choose? Are they linking together, building your um, main point, um, answering your central research question? Are they appropriate? Are the illustrations and the details guiding readers and building this together? So this isn't cohesive in the same way an academic essay is cohesive um, with topic sentences and therefore whereas but they're cohesive in a way that at the end they everything works together to make readers think um, always back to e shelley reed and her principles of writing or paying attention to the audience this is 25 percent so you're adapting to your audience and your purpose by incorporating her principles effectively building ethos, evoking emotions, and constructing logos. And that's what um, repetition does. That's what showing and not just telling does. That's what um, making sure that you're not assuming your audience can read your mind. That's what those, they do. Um, balancing um, jello and fruit. Um, yeah, all those things. Um, author identity is really important. Identity is the theme for the summer session. And so you are crafting an identity in order to create a meaningful connection with your primary audience that strengthens your overall essay. And that means you've got to reveal things about yourself. Um, you're going to do that through your language, through your stories, through details about yourself. Philip Lopate talks about that and he says in personal essays nothing is more commonly met than the letter i and he says i think it's perfectly good word one no writer should be ashamed to use the problem with i is not that it is in bad taste but that fledgling personal essayists may think they've said or conveyed more than they actually have with that one syllable in their minds, the eye is swarming with background and a lush sticky past and an almost too fatal specificity, whereas the reader encountering it for the first time in a new piece sees only a slender telephone pole standing in the sentence, trying to catch a few signals to send on. In truth, even the barest eye holds a whisper of promised engagement and can suggest a caress in the midst of a more solid language. What it doesn't do, however, is give us a clear picture of who is thinking. And to do that, the writer, that is you, needs to develop yourself into a character. Show us your quirks. Do that through language, through details, through stories. Um, Lope talks a lot about that in his article, and it's really important that you do that. That is 10% of the final grade and the final 10 percent is editing word choice clarity now i want to emphasize that you are not using you should not be using um, an academic voice unless that's what's called for in this essay you could use slang you could use non-standard english um, you are connecting with an audience. And that it doesn't mean editing doesn't count, it just means that your editing is rhetorical. You might find yourself using run-on sentences, but those run-on sentences need to be designed carefully to connect to the audience. You might use fragments, you might use profanity, Think about what you're doing and the overall effect. One last thing from Graham um, before I wrap up. Fundamentally, an essay, this kind of essay, is a train of thought, but it's a cleaned up train of thought as dialogue is cleaned up conversation. Real thought, like real conversation, is full of false starts. It would be exhausting to read. You need to cut and fill to emphasize the central thread, like an illustrator inking over a pencil drawing. But don't change so much that you lose the spontaneity 
of the original. An essay is not a reference work. It's not something you read looking for a specific answer and feel cheated if you don't find it. He says, I'd much rather read an essay that went off in an unexpected but interesting direction than one that plotted dutifully along a prescribed course. Surprise is important. What's interesting? He says, for me, interesting means surprise. Surprise us. If you tell us what we're going to read straight up, and then we read it, it's going to seem like an academic essay. And you know that academic essays aren't always the most exciting things to read. But you know that the personal essays that you read drew you in. That's your job as you tackle this genre. Few final things, show and don't just tell. I have not spent more than a few hours in New York City, and yet when I read Megan Dom's My Misspent Youth, I could see the streets she wandered. As you go back over your memories in order to tell the stories, you're going to find some gaps that you don't have all the details. That means you need to do what Kelly Linfor said and re-remember them. It means you might have to do some research to re-remember them. Find another description and then plant it in your memory. Um, fill in the gaps using research um, so that you can take your readers to that place so that they can be there with you. Um, stay away from the phrase fast forward as a transition. Instead, transition by showing your readers where you are now, setting the scene, giving ages, um, describing the place. Be careful about using second person. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Does your mentor text use the word you and address the reader directly? Well, then it's probably okay for you to do that. But stay away from asking your reader audience to imagine things. Um, that is a strategy a lot of um, young essayists might do, starting an essay by, imagine you're doing this. But think of your mentor texts. They don't ask their audiences to imagine. They set the scene so that their audience can imagine what's inside of their heads. Asking your audience to imagine things is basically asking your audience to read your mind. Don't do that. Um, as you move forward with revision, um, obviously read the comments from your peer reviewers. Read my comments. If you don't understand them, make an appointment to see me. And it doesn't hurt to make an appointment with the Writing Center. Um, be sure my, to share my comments so the tutor can give your feedback based on my criteria. Um, but keep in mind that the mentor text is probably not familiar. <laughs> I said this wrong. Keep in mind that your tutor is probably not familiar with your mentor text. And that means that they can't give you that feedback. They don't understand the structure that you're using. And so they're just commenting on what's on the page. Um, if you do e-tutoring, which is the asynchronous, you might be able to link the um, tutor to that, but we keep in mind that when they're reading your paper, they only have 30 minutes. So that's all I've got. Oh yeah, you get extra credit for going to the Writing Center. And so now I'm done. Happy revision. <laughs>